So in this video, we're going to take a look at this process of regulating gene expression here. And if you go back and think about some of what we looked at, um, it all goes back to that idea that cells that can save energy are going to be able to use that energy to reproduce more effectively. And so the ones that <clears throat> develop mutations that are favorable to saving energy are going to be the ones that will come to dominate in the population. And one example that we saw before is that cells can um, save some energy by controlling the enzymes. And if you remember this process of feedback inhibition, or end product inhibition. Um, we've got our enzyme pathway right here. The first enzyme in this pathway binds to your subrate and substrate and converts it um, through a series of different enzyme catalyzed reactions. We end up with our end product here. In this case, the end product is able to bind to the first enzyme in this pathway to the allosteric site, and in this case, it's an allosteric inhibitor. So if you think about this process, you shut down the first enzyme in the pathway, you shut down the whole pathway, you stop making end product, eventually the end product is not going to be there and you'll have free enzyme that can go back, and so you can alternate between your enzyme being off with the product bound or on with the product not bound to the allosteric site. And so this will save the cell some energy because they're not using, say, this is going to involve ATP use right there. Um, that could cause the cell to um, use up a whole bunch of ATP and save a little bit of ATP if they do have this allosteric site that developed in their enzyme. But what we want to take a look at is this process of controlling gene expression. And if you think about this, if you can control whether or not your gene is turned on or off, you're not going to be transcribing uh, RNA messages from the gene. So you save all of the energy there. Um, your average message is about a thousand bases long. So think about all of those ATP equivalent, thousands of those that are going to be saved. But you're also not doing translation. And so that's going to save even more energy as you're using all of those amino acids. Your ribosome is doing the peptidyl transferase as it shuttles down the message. All of that is going to be using um, a huge amount of energy that the cell could potentially save, especially if they're under conditions where they don't need that product to be available there. And if we look at this at the level of the gene, um, your E. coli RNA polymerase um, enzyme right here, it has a core of um, proteins that are going to assemble, and those guys can bind loosely to the DNA. Maybe they'll run into a promoter, but effectively that core of the RNA polymerase does not um, transcribe genes very well. But if you add on your sigma 70 factor in your E. coli cells that are out there, now this holoenzyme is targeted to the promoters that are out there, and those promoters are going to be used more effectively, and so now you're going to get transcription of your genes. And we find this with um, what are known as housekeeping genes. These are constitutive genes that are always turned on. So something like an enzyme for... Um, making phospholipids for the membrane. If you don't have that on all the time, the cell's going to lose its membrane, or maybe enzymes involved in the process of glycolysis. But what about genes that you don't need to have on all the time? You want to stop doing transcription and translation of those to save energy because you don't need them. And what E. coli has come up with is alternative versions of their sigma factor that are out there. And you can take your core RNA polymerase over here that actually does your transcription reaction. We'll fix that on the fly. And when this... Um, cell needs to have some alternative genes, they use alternative sigma factors. So rather than sigma 70 binding to the core, you get like this sigma S over here. And now this little guy is going to bind to your core and that's going to turn on genes that are going to um, be found in cells that are going through their stationary phase. So they're going to be cutting down on a lot of processes, but they only need these genes expressed during certain times. How about flagella genes? If you are going to stick to a surface in a biofilm, you don't need to make flagella. So save your energy by not doing transcription and translation of your flagella um, proteins that are out there, like flagellin. So by doing this, you just have to have an alternative sigma factor um, that can get used, and that'll regulate transcription and translation of um, the genes and those gene products that are out there for the cells. 
So when we look at this alternative process, this is what's known as an operon that was first um, described by two French guys back in the 1960s when um, they were looking at the growth of bacteria and noticed that there were some um, differences in the rate of the growth of those cells depending on um, what substances were available for them. And so they postulated this idea that maybe there are um, sets of genes that are out there. And remember, we're looking at polycystronic genes, so you transcribe one message and you can get multiple proteins translated off of that message but they came up with this idea that maybe there is something in between the promoter and the gene itself that could regulate the transcription of that gene and so when we look at this process there's a regulatory gene out there that makes a protein that actually is going to be able to come over and bind to this operator region and their hypothesis was that this repressor protein protein right here would bind to the operator and that could block your RNA polymerase from getting through. And so if you think about that, this is kind of like a little orange cone in the street where it's going to cause people to go around or stop the traffic that is there. And if you don't have traffic going through, you're not making your messages and you're not making your proteins there. So if we put this operon model into play, there's really two ways that this could work. One of them, um, you have something that turns stuff off, and the other one, you have something that turns things on. And when we look at anabolic genes for biosynthesis, you always want those genes to be making their products. You always want the cell to have the ability to make things. But if you've got too much of something, just like with end product inhibition, too much is um, not necessarily a good thing because you're wasting energy. Maybe the cell could save some energy by regulating this biosynthesis gene. And so when we look at our tryptophan biosynthesis operon, it is actually a repressible operon. Your RNA polymerase normally binds to the promoter. It reads through the operator. And you go ahead and you transcribe your polycystronic message that codes for or five different enzymes or five different proteins there that are going to take your precursor and turn it into your amino acid tryptophan. So like I said, normally the cell would be making tryptophan as part of um, its anabolic biosynthesis gene pathway there. And if we look at this process, well, you want to be able to control this. You want to save some energy and not waste energy making that message and making all those enzymes if you've already got plenty of tryptophan around. Why continue wasting energy making this if you've already got this? And I sort of use the analogy of if you're going to go to a buffet, are you going to eat before you can go to an all-you-can-eat buffet? That's just stupid. So the cells evolve this ability to regulate expression of this message right here. And the way they do it is when that tryptophan is present in excess, it binds to our trip repressor protein and that causes a structural change in the protein. So now it's the right shape to bind to the operator. And as long as the trip repressor is bound to the operator, that is going to um, block your RNA polymerase and your gene is going to be turned off. So the cell is going to save that energy that would be used to make the message, to make the enzyme, and to make your tryptophan if you've already got plenty of it floating around in the cell. And so if we think about this, the cell is basically going to go back and forth between an on and an off and it's regulated by your repressor which is also regulated by the presence of your amino acid being there so as long as you don't have your trip you want to have your gene turned on so your repressor floats around in the cell but once enough trip is made it binds to the repressor and activates that repressor protein so tryptophan is known as a co-repressor and that is going to shut down your gene expression right there. So nice little idea that the cells can regulate biosynthetic genes so that as long as you've got plenty in the cell, you don't need to make any more and waste your energy. Um, if we look at the lactose operon, this is what's known as an inducible operon. Here, you're looking at a gene that's involved in breaking down the um, disaccharide sugar lactose. So here, this is an operon for a catabolic gene. And normally, catabolic gene operons are turned off because you don't need to make your enzymes to break something down if what you, those enzymes work on isn't actually present. And so in this case, unlike the tryptophan operon, your 
your oppressor does not need to bind to anything in order to bind to your DNA. This is the active form of that repressor protein. It blocks the RNA polymerase and the cell is no longer going to be able to make its message that has the proteins that would be involved in um, the metabolism of our disaccharide lactose. You add some lactose to the cells and it binds to the repressor. So effectively your repressor falls off the operator there and now your RNA polymerase can go ahead and do its transcription and then you can go ahead and get your translation. And this actually encodes three different proteins on our polycystronic message right there. Um, when you look at this, you've got um, LAC-Z, which is a beta-galactosidase enzyme that actually chops the two sugars in lactose. It breaks the covalent bond right there. The middle one that I've drawn in green right here, this encodes what's known as the LAC-Y part of the gene there. And that is an enzyme that actually inserts itself into the membrane of the cells that transports lactose. So we've got these two enzymes. One transports lactose into the cells, the other breaks it down. And that's going to produce our glucose and galactose sugars. And the LAC-A, nobody really knows what the cells are using that for, but they have been able to figure out um, the enzyme activity, but they don't know why. So if we think about this, similar to what we saw with um, our trip gene, here, rather than the trip being the thing that is activating your repressor to bind, um, the lactose is actually inactivating the repressor or causing it to fall off the operator so that you can get transcription and translation and you use up your lactose and that's going to cause your cell to go over to this state where your repressor now binds. So the cell is saving the energy for transcription and translation. And if we go back and look at the original thing, this is how they first sort of discovered this process. They grew up E. coli with glucose and lactose together and they found that the E. coli used the glucose first and then it would switch over to lactose and there is this lag and this is where you've got your gene being expressed during this lag period and they don't get as much energy out of that lactose there and what they found from looking at it some more is that um, we've actually got another thing that comes into play not only do you have um, your operator being controlled with your repressor binding, but there's actually another message that the cells can send out um, called catabolite activator protein. And what happens is in the presence of glucose, the cells don't make um, CAMP, which is a modified version of AT or AMP, adenosine monophosphate, that is a cyclic form. And as long as this is not around, you're not going to have this cat protein binding to the promoter. So you're going to have very little amount of transcription because you don't need to make those lac genes if lactose isn't there. But when you use up the glucose, the cells start to make cyclic AMP and that activates the CAMP or the cat protein to bind to your promoter. And and that actually stimulates your RNA polymerase activity. So not only do you not have a repressor bound, but now you've got a supercharged RNA polymerase, and that's really gonna cause the cells to make a whole bunch of message, which means they're gonna make a whole bunch of enzyme to transport and metabolize the lactose and break it down. Um, this is all transcription, or this is all regulation at the level of the gene. Um, when people were looking at the trip operon, they actually found some mutations that developed in the cells that did not um, fall into this model of operons. And so they came up with a different uh, model and they tested it and found out that you can get a process that is known as attenuation. And this is really interesting because here you get a message that is transcribed from the um, the trip gene right here and it's got little areas within it that are called domains and they found that you can actually get the uh, middle domain number three can pair or hydrogen bond with either um, domain two or domain four and when you look at this process in um, the presence of excess tryptophan so the cells got a whole bunch of this floating around they make a short little protein um, that has a whole bunch of trip and so the ribosome is going to shoot through here and you form this stem loop between three and four and that blocks transcription and if you stop transcription that's also going to stop translation so you've got plenty of trip why make more and this side 
the trip is um, not there and the ribosome is going to stall. And so that's going to cause a formation of a different bond between those areas. We can also look at transcription or translation control with riboswitches, and you can take a look at the video for that. And we can also look at regulation in eukaryotic cells that is a lot more complicated.